Imagine what Labour would have done to those brave seafarers who risked all on the chance of success. Just imagine had they been in power in those days. First, those merchant venturers who went out in the times of the first Elizabeth, they would have had to have been registered. <laughs> then, they'd have to enter into a planning agreement with the relevant government department. <laughs> After that, there'd be meetings with the Minister of Trade to decide which merchant would be allowed to venture and where. <laughs> then the National Investment Bank would have to decide if anyone was allowed to invest in the fitting out of the ship and which pension fund was to be expected to risk its money. <laughs> and then the TUC would have nominated 50% of the representatives of any governing body to decide on a division of the profits if there were any after tax. <laughs> a merchant venturer could then, with all those permissions, leave Britain as long as he'd cleared the voyage with a foreign investment unit and satisfied the shop stewards that there were no non-union cabin boys on board. <laughs> He says this on page 104 of his book, Labour's housing policy was dominated by dogma and the vested interests of a minority of activists whose power was based on the local authority building departments and who were out of touch with and apparently completely unconcerned with the wishes of British families. Conservatives want you to have what you want. Labour wants you to have what they want. Yes, he did indeed give a battery of statistics over the first two years. But has he forgotten his own two years when from March 1974 it took just over two years to be on the way to the IMF because his government hadn't the guts to follow the right policies to put things right themselves? stages retire, all are forced out. They are replaced by the new militant left. In fact, you can see socialism in action today in the council chambers of local government, in Liverpool, in Lambeth, in Haringey, and in many others, as you so vividly described in this conference. That's what it would be like if Labour ever got power at Westminster. Mr. President, the militant left will not be beaten by brave words and ritual disclaimers. If the Labour leadership is genuinely against these people, why don't they expel them? Yes, he mentioned places like Linwood. I was a member of the government that sent the factory to Linwood with the best of intentions, with all of the possible regional aids. That factory which went to Linwood made a loss in 18 out of the 19 years of its existence. And I say to him in all honesty, that could not possibly go on. And when speaking yesterday, the Director General, speaking about the alternative socialist policies, said this, let there be no going back to the days of industrial relations chaos, to the bogus sham that was the corporate state, to useless so-called agreements that no one can deliver where it matters on the ground at local level, to nationalization, that there be no going back to local rates, the principle of representation without taxation for householders, to the poisonous politics of envy, let there be, <clears throat> let there be no going back in short <coughs> to the dreary, dreadful days of failure yeah, under yeah. socialism. <laughs> yes, one honourable gentleman called out to me when he thought that the words were mine. Called out to me, asked the CBI. I am quoting from the CBI, from the people who know how to run industry, not from the politicians. He referred to the tragedy at Consett and Corby. But he was a member of a government that put off steel closures that should have been dealt with years before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
His government refused to face reality in the steel industry. He pointed out that his government sustained the number of people in jobs. Is he suggesting that steel would have a better future or that British Leyland would have a better future if we put back all of those people who have been made redundant? They'd have had no possible future at all, nor would productivity ever have, been, ever have risen, and indeed, all of the prospect of future jobs would have disappeared forever. The Honourable Gentleman and his party have a rather different view. They still believe that prosperity can be created by politicians rather than by enterprise. So they'd make, I quote, strategic interventions in key sectors of industry. In other words, take money from successful firms to hand out to failures. They'd restore a host of powers to union bosses to damage industry and bully their members. They'd bring back nationalization, taking power back from managers who know how to run the business to give it to socialist politicians who don't. Mr. Speaker, the ex-communists in Eastern Europe are far more advanced in their economic thinking than the backward-looking British Labour Party which the right honourable gentleman leads.